Uh, well, I'm very happy to present to you uh, Dr. Aromatici. Dr. Aromatici, Hello. Dr. Aromatici is, is a very organic people. I mean, it's, it's some, something that involves very, very tough. He's a, a director of uh, one of the most important uh, divisions of uh, the Fiera Milano Group. Fiera Milano Group uh, is representing the company uh, where uh, Fiera Milano, uh, let's say, can, can survive, can live uh, and earn money and make profit by uh, maintaining the network, maintaining and increasing and developing the network of company coming here. So, <coughs> the, uh, giving to us uh, a completely different perspective of methods than in comparison with, uh, you know, with the Western methods in doing the, 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 the field crop or uh, plant. Um, uh, I think that we will grant the, the, this morning this class uh, with uh, a break in the middle of the presentation in order to stretch a little bit and then to coffee, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think I can say that uh, Dr. Aromatic is available to receive questions. More than all, and love his speech. He's a very informed person. And uh, I don't want to lose your time. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor Sinatra. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on my business card, it doesn't say anything uh, on a hierarchical level, not director, not responsible for. It says just international business development. Because this is the key uh, to our company, to many companies. So basically, uh, my division and what uh, my team does is to try and find new opportunities worldwide for a company to be present in several markets. Because uh, needless to say, although Fiera Milano has a long tradition in organizing fairs, or trade shows, and exhibitions, uh, uh, it doesn't suffice anymore to be present in Milan. We need, like every regular company, to be present worldwide. So a few years ago, we started investing abroad. It was a different market back then. Uh, we had different uh, ideas on what the BRICS economy would develop into it. I think that none of us would have thought, five years down the road, for is down the road to find a Brazil which is in recession and basically blocked by a scandal, Russia uh, in the situation that it is today, uh, the ISIS menace that's creating problems in Africa and, and the southern part of Turkey. So all around the world, the situation is very tough. Uh, it is very difficult to give the stability which is needed to the companies to do business. We are basically, as an institution, uh, just a tool to develop business for other companies, obviously trying to make money in the process. There is a, a medium in the English language. Is anybody American here or Canadian? Okay. You're familiar with it at the end of the day. Uh, it means that after everything that happened, you have to consider something. The equivalent in the Italian language is alla fine della fiera, at the end of the fair, at the end of the exhibition. That means also that in our culture, this is very profoundly rooted that the fair, the exhibition, meeting uh, the offer and the demand, a market, a Roman market, if you think about 2,000 years ago, was just at the beginning of a fair. It was meeting together those that were selling and those that were buying. So it is very well rooted in our uh, culture, profoundly rooted that the fair, where people that are manufacturing, producing, and selling meet those who are buying. Um, we are, as Professor said, uh, one of the largest operators. And again, in the, in the Italian language, we only have one word, fiera, that it can be translated in three different ways in English, because one thing is the site where we organize, and then we call it fiera. Then is the actual trade show, which is called fiera. Uh, and then the company itself, which is fiera. So we just use one word, but basically with three different meanings. So this is just to give you an idea even in the language, how the Italian language is structured, how important and central this is. Uh, like most Italian companies, we have a, a long-standing tradition. We're almost 100 years old. Um, the first fair that was organized, and it was a fiera campionaria, which means basically uh, a cross-industry exhibition, was organized in 1922. Uh, does anyone have an idea how many companies were present? Take a guess, give me a number. 
20. Close enough, eight. There were eight companies that organized the first cross-industry uh, event in Fiala Milan. Obviously, uh, we had done a lot of progress. Uh, like most of the Italian economy, we grew in the 70s and the 60s, in the 70s and the 60s and the 70s. Well, the small and medium-sized companies were growing because this was our first client. Uh, a lot of small companies that did not have enough structure to sell their products by themselves, or they had it, but also they needed something else, another tool, they were working together with Fiera Milano in order to grow at national level in the very beginning. So that was the very first step that was organized. Obviously Milan has always been, in this country, the center of the economic trade, the center of the uh, industry, the financing. So uh, there are other, of course, other organizations in this country, uh, but Milan always had the advantage of being seen as a central term of reference and also on a geographical point of view, it's much closer to France and Switzerland and Austria and other, country, and other countries in Southern Europe. So it became uh, definitely one of the main engines uh, of the Italian and South uh, European economy. Uh, then there was uh, another change uh, later on uh, in, the 80, in the 80s when the concept of Fiera Campionale was starting to change, so there were more. Uh, industrial sectors that were developing themselves and therefore we started working with a very important element in the Italian economy which are the industry associations. Uh, Fiera Milano owns some of the exhibitions and trade shows that we have and that we, uh, we organize and some are owned by industry associations and so we organize on behalf of them uh, these events. And so we, we developed for years up until the form that we have today. So, we are one of the leading uh, powerhouses, but not, uh, uh, I would say, in the top five, probably. There are in this business two different business models, and this is important because we'll go back through it when we talk about networks. There is a business model which is typically a uh, center European, German, Germany, France, Italy, uh, Spain as well, where the stakeholder of the territory, the lander in Germany, the regions uh, in Italy and France, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the municipalities have invested directly in developing a center uh, for organizing exhibitions. And so the center for organizing exhibitions is the driving force, and this is important from something that we'll tell you later on. And then we have the more international uh, company, mostly American or British, where they do not have uh, a site that they own, but they just rent spaces uh, around the world. Uh, I would say up until three, four years ago, having a very strong organizing facility was a very good asset for being competitive. This is changing very fast because of the responsibility that comes with having a very large uh, facility on site. Number one, because the stakeholders are all willing to bring the world to that point. So, in other words, to organize fairs which are international and are able to bring buyers, exhibitors, media from all around the world to St. Milan, to Paris, to Barcelona, uh, to Hanover, and so forth. Um, this is a way of doing internationalization in a passive way. But it's better for uh, the Chamber of Commerce because the restaurants are full, because as you know very well, the uh, hotel rooms prices go up. Uh, in case you decide to stay here or you have your parents or your relatives coming for the expo, make sure that you have your rooms already, um, uh, already secured because the prices will be three times as high as it usually is all around Milan. So, there are opportunities for the local uh, economy to get you know, uh, resources enough. And then, of course, there's the other way around, which is not uh, in opposition, but it is a, a way of co-developing the local facilities to be abroad. Uh, and we do this like other, uh, other uh, companies do it, uh, through developing an international network. So today we have... Uh, uh, seven companies around the world, actually we have eight, then I will get into details later on, around the world, mostly into the BRICS area, so it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Turkey, um, Singapore, uh, we have a cooperation and now, we're finally landing in the States for the first time uh, in May. Uh, we do not have a company there yet, but we are in the process of looking for one. Uh, 
because we have chosen those areas going back seven years ago, eight years ago when the economy was a totally different story, uh, because this was the area where the Italian companies were willing to expand it. Most companies around the world were looking at Brazil, at Russia, at India, at China as the new market to come. Uh, because this is a very important concept. Uh, Fiera Milano, like every organizer of exhibition, can only survive and thrive if they work together with the companies and the exhibitors in going to places where these companies are willing to go. We at times help the company better understand that there are marketing researches which are done, there are uh, cooperation agreements which are developed with several countries. There is a lot of interaction between Fiera Milano and industry associations with the Chamber of Commerce in order to understand how to help the companies to, uh, to go abroad. Um, the last time I was here, uh, I was working for a, a different uh, organization. I just joined uh, on July 1st last year, Fiera Milano, and I was working for the Footwear Association, Italian Footwear Association. And I was also the uh, CEO of the NICAM. The NICAM is the largest footwear exhibition in the world. And we did exactly what I was describing before, together with Fiera Milano, so I was working on the other side as a client, as a manager. We had decided that China was the place to go for the Italian Footwear Association. And so together with Fiera Milano, we have developed a marketing research on the country. We have assessed in what city to go. There were several options, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Indian, we decided for Shanghai. We worked together uh, with the uh, local authorities in China because in Shanghai you need to have authorizations to organize fair if you are not a Chinese company. And the strategy there, and again, this is an example of cooperation, and to some extent, uh, not per se in a network, but in a way of working together. Because if you think about an association, basically it is a network of company, an industry association. But on the other hand, there was the uh, Fiat Milan that already had its network in China with its company. So there were two networks working, to, working together in order to develop a new project. And I just came back from Shanghai last week. It was the fifth edition uh, of the Mikan Shanghai, uh, now has changed very much into uh, a much wider event together with apparel, together with furs, together with accessories. So it's the overall system of the Italian fashion uh, industry that's going together uh, to Shanghai to exhibit their goods. Um, these are examples that can give you an idea on how different are the different ways of cooperating together with group of industries, uh, with uh, um, exhibition centers, uh, with uh, organizations uh, and single companies. Uh, we have uh, about a hundred exhibitions both in Italy and around the world. Uh, some of them, as I said, owned by Fiera Milano. So we organize, we decide, we choose uh, uh, the, the timing, the schedule, which is very important. Uh, we select the industry groups and so forth. Uh, and we cover a very wide number of sectors. Uh, I know that especially those who come from outside Italy have the idea that here we're just working uh, you know, with nice clothes and nice food uh, and maybe a little bit of design and furniture. But there's much more that meets the eye. Uh, in Brazil we're present uh, with the uh, oil and gas sector, we're present in the safety and security field, so some industrial field. Uh, through the joint venture in India and in China we work as well from tourism, uh, to uh, woodworking machineries, uh, uh, to um, distribution uh, in, in several sectors. So, uh, yes, it is true that we, to some extent, reflect what the economy and the industry in Italy is, but at the other time, at the other, on the other hand, we're also working in other areas which are not known for being a very strong point in the Italian industry economy. Um, just to give you an idea, we move uh, to Milan only to Milan, about 5 million people uh, every year. And this is just those who enter into the gates of the Fiera. So at times they come with other people, they come to Milan for doing business. So the impact on the economy is extremely, extremely strong. Uh, this is just to give you an idea uh, on a more elaborated way on how we work and, and what is at the core of an organization like ours. Uh, we are definitely a tool of industrial policy, so as I said before, we are the vessel to help the Italian and European companies, and in the end, basically, the exhibitors worldwide that we have in Milan to go abroad. 
uh, and we do this directly or we do this in combination of the association or we do this in combination of our branch offices around the world. Uh, there is a very important geographic expansion. Uh, we haven't started to expand uh, worldwide uh, as, as fast as the Germans did. Germans started this uh, Anhove, Messe, Nürbe, um, uh, Munich uh, 20 years ago because probably the industry in Germany started before we did to become more international, investing the road. So once again you see that a fair exhibition, and a trade show exhibition is very much linked to the economy and the industry and the companies of the, of the country that represents. Um, but we catch up with it and uh, we're now present uh, in several countries and also we have a, a network of, of agents uh, so selling the services uh, of, our, uh, of our company to about 50 countries. Um, and also what we're doing is uh, what is called geocloning. Geocloning is the way that uh, uh, almost every organization works with. And basically, we have some brands, you might know or might not know, but just to give you some idea, these are the brands that uh, Fiera Milano owns and are some of them. <coughs> These are some examples, but as I was saying before, it's not just about food and fashion. Uh, it is also about food and fashion, but host deals specifically with Horeca, and so coffee machine, uh, um, uh, contractors uh, for hotels, uh, um, large kitchen, uh, uh, everything that deals with bars and restaurants uh, and hotels and so forth. And obviously to the food, uh, it's mostly about the area of, of, of food and agriculture. BIT is for tourism. H-O-M-I deals with all the design and uh, um, uh, accessories that have to do with the uh, housing. So from, uh, uh, from glasses uh, and kitchenware and tableware and textile for the house uh, and so forth. The decorations, uh, basically the market of interior decorators and architectures. Uh, then we have Transportec uh, for transportation, heavy transportation, we're talking not just about cars but mostly about trucks and everything that involves that. Exposec for security and safety. The geocloning process basically it works in a way that is trying to expand, let's say, from Milano to other countries, their brands. Uh, it could be done directly using uh, the brand name, which is known already, or it can be a combination uh, of more than one brand. For instance, we put together Tutto Food and, uh, uh, and Host, create a new brand, which is Food, Hospitality, World, which is now only in two years present in Brazil, China, in South Africa, uh, and in India. And this is one way to go. So basically, we provide the companies that are already exhibiting uh, in Milan the possibility of going with a new platform uh, which combines two worlds which are very compatible between each other uh, to be present in four countries. This is a global product. But also, uh, what we are now beginning to do is a more complex uh, uh, possibility of geocloning, which excludes Milan as well, because uh, one of the key competitive factors for an operator like us is important to be very strong uh, in some fields, and we are, like you know, some sort of the mobile and design and food and so forth, but also to be able to expand the portfolio, to have as many exhibitions as possible. Uh, pretty much like every company, it is nice to have a small company, but in our field only the big players are able to survive and there's a strong concentration, there's a lot of uh, acquisitions and merging uh, and joint ventures that have been going on in the past five years in this business. So now we have a structure which you might describe, and so we're already getting to the idea of a network as uh, stellar and in the sense that we have either branch offices 
which are 100% owned by Fiat Milano, uh, or, or we have, okay, these are some, Singapore, um, that it is uh, the consequence of the strategy of Fiat Milano we decided to go in every single market, respecting the market and finding a player that was important uh, to play with and join forces with. So let's say in China and India, uh, Hanover Messe, Deutsche Messe, uh, was already present and we decided to join forces with them because their portfolio was very compatible with ours. We were working mostly in the areas that are typically Italian, they were mostly working in the areas that are typically German. So we decided to have a 50-50 joint venture. So we operate in India and China together with Deutsche Messe. We decide you know, where to expand, how to assess the portfolio, in what direction to work with the industry. Uh, then in other countries which are smaller, let's say South Africa and Turkey, we decided to buy a company which was already present there. Obviously, there's a very long process into the acquisition from due diligence to the financial due diligence uh, to gathering all the business intelligence. Um, but let's say on a smaller operation, we decided to buy company fully. In larger operation, we decided to retain uh, the local investors and the entrepreneur that developed uh, the company itself because this business, every business, but this business in particular, the business of exhibition and trade show is a people business. 90% is the relations you have developed with the market, with the buyers, the knowledge. So if you take away the entrepreneur that founded the company and probably uh, his or her right hand to buy it out, if you're not strong enough for that particular country, you're going to lose uh, all of your business because a lot is personal relations. Uh, and it can go you know, from very, very simple things to very complicated things. Um, let's say South Africa. Uh, in, uh, we are present both in Johannesburg and Cape Town, but the company is located in Cape Town. We had a company that was already working for 20 years. And there was a lady, uh, Christine Cashmore, that was uh, the person who founded this company. And since ever, she was the person who contracted the local venues, uh, the exhibitions. She was able to get a contract that nobody else would be able to get because of the knowledge that she had with the people, the knowledge that she had with the market, the respect that she was given by the market. And therefore, to buy her out right away would have been a terrible mistake because it would have an impact on all the costs, operating costs of the company, on all the relationship with the uh, journalists, the media, uh, the industry. So in this case, we had a process, or we have a process of uh, um, time to buy out in the sense that we started uh, acquiring the majority of the company, but we left her and her daughter both working in the company, so it was a female executive company, um, and they started to work towards their, uh, uh, their leaving the company in a three years time. So we had time to work together with them uh, in order to acquire more knowledge, uh, to find out the different structure of the company, to get to know better the market. And with a common agreement, with a contract, after three years, today, now they own another company, much richer than they were before, but we have 100% own branch office uh, in, uh, in South Africa. Um, with the example that was given you before with India and China, we will never get out of the joint venture with Panova Mesa because it's a very compatible and very fruitful cooperation. Yes, at times it is a headache, at times it is very difficult to come to terms with a very different point of view uh, that the German colleagues have, but uh, that's also part of uh, you know, being part of a very strong international group. You have to retain and be genuine to who you are what your core business is, what your main stakeholder want from you, uh, but at the same time you need to think in the way the local companies and the local markets do. And at times, this is our job and the job of, of my team, is to be able to translate not just on a linguistic point of view, but on a business-minded point of view, the way things are done in China, the way things are done in India, and the way Milan thinks it should be done. So this is probably the conundrum we're always in. Before we get more into the details, I would like you to show the complexity of Fiera Milano. 
uh, because if you understand what we are, and we have a short video for that, probably it's easier then to understand some of the things I'm going to tell you about. Um, it's a short video, and it's in English, so just let's have a look at this, and then I will stop in case you have questions, and then I'll proceed more. Communicating, greatly valued, and putting the world. In short, growing together with great enterprise. Yeah, Milano. Milano, the Italian capital of economy and finance, design and fashion, publishing and university. And tomorrow, the Milan of the 2015 Expo. The exhibition center in the heart of Milan is a showcase of Italian stuff and has been an international center of trade for almost a century. Piero Milano leads the international exhibition sector as regards sites, services, and excellence in its business for business events. But it is also a special venue where futuristic steel and glass architecture gracefully combines beauty with functionality in a magical pattern of light, shade, and water.
It satisfies all stand requirements, from the simplest proposal to tailored solutions. It provides an excellent catering service with over 80 bars, self-service and pandemic restaurants, which make every break a special event. It organizes travel packages for visitors and assists them in the meeting the annual welcome rights. Here at much more than a great exhibition center, an integrated group of companies at your service, helping you to build your success in Italy and in the world. Okay, like every institutional bit is supposed to be inspiring and show you how great we are. Uh, here I think it's important and relevant for you to understand how complex we are. And complexity can only, only be dealt by networks and groups of companies. So I don't know if you were able to catch an expression inside this video that says it's a city within a city. And this is exactly what, uh, what Fiera Milano, the facility of Fiera Milano is. And uh, to show you this even more so before we go back to our international structure, I wanted to show you, sorry it's in Italian, but it's very easy to understand. Uh, first of all, let me show this. Uh, these are the uh, gross uh, exhibiting spaces of the main players around the world. So if you, if you look at it, Hanover Mess is the largest so far, but they are reducing very soon to about 100,000 square meters because of the uh, maintenance costs, which now are the real uh, challenge for all the uh, groups and organizations uh, that are working, especially in Europe, in organizing the exhibitions. As I said before, the paradox is that the market is changing so fast that what was an asset, a very complex and, and, and a very strong and very wide a facility center, uh, which costs a lot of money and which uh, and entails a lot of cooperation on a physical ground, which is the city where you are located. It's now becoming less important than it was five years ago because the flexibility and the capability of being present uh, worldwide is becoming much more important or as important as the local. So some companies like Hanover have decided a more draconian, more direct way of doing things uh, uh, is to shorten and to close a very large, like 25% of the space uh, because they are investing more abroad. They are managing uh, exhibition centers uh, in uh, not only in India and China where we are together, but also in Indonesia, in Thailand. So the attention is moving from Europe as investors to other countries. We have decided a different way, so we will stay strong in Milan because Milan is probably able to attract more than an over for its position, its connectability, uh, um, a number of very strong connections that are made, Milan fashion, Milan design, Milan furniture. If you ask me what does an over inspire you to, I don't think that you can come up with any industrial sector at all. Yes, industry, yes, reliability, yes, German, but there is no work between the association of the city of Hanover and any uh, strong industry. When it comes to Milan, thank God we have we a few. So we have decided a different strategy. We will keep a strong center in Milan and we will buy companies around the world uh, to expand to other areas. But even China, you know, Guangzhou is a very large center, but if you look at it, it's the fourth. To be honest with you, there is uh, a new winner coming up in this list. Shanghai has opened very recently, you know, last week, where we were there, uh, a new center, which is not finished yet, and this is going to be the, the largest in the world. Uh, but then again, I would say, for China and for the exhibition business, uh, um, it is a bit different, because the political decision of the Communist Party in China was to move the main activities from Beijing, where the political power was, to Shanghai. So they have built this enormous facility, and now they are imposing to every industry association, to every organizer, to move 
to Shanghai. In Europe, this can be done. So it's, it's a completely different uh, way of thinking things. And I'm sure the Chinese will be successful. But their way of doing business cannot be replicated exactly the same way in Europe uh, as we do it. So, as you can see, there are different strategies depending on who the stakeholders are, who the investors are, and what are the uh, elements and the parameters which are of the country where you're present. But uh, going back to how complex Fiat Milano is, this is just to give you an idea. We are much bigger than any other organization. There are several. Um, Italy, and I'm talking mostly to the non-Italian students, is very famous for being the city-state. Uh, so cities, provinces, regions uh, are more important and more relevant into the economy than a centralized economy. So in this case, we really are on the opposite scale of other countries. Um, so again, because the fairs, because the venues, because the fiere developed according to the industrial model, even in Italy we have many, too many uh, centers that organize fairs. This was good until, I would say, the economy was different before 2008. Now there, there are, most of the organizers, even the biggest one, Verona, Bologna, Rimini, and there are probably in every, almost in every uh, capoluogo di provincia, the head of the province, there is a small uh, exhibition center. I come from a very small town in Italy, it's called Pesaro, it has 80,000 uh, 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 inhabitants. We have an exhibition center, so just to give you the idea of the scale. But these centers are always, were always either funded by the local government, they were funded by the Chamber of Commerce, and now that there are less and less money in the public uh, system, all of these companies are either bankrupting or getting out of business. So, Fiat Milano is, on one hand, still depending very much, not so much from the money, but from the political and strategical influence of the stakeholders, Chamber of Commerce, Regional Milan, Regional Lombardy, City of Milan, but at the same time, it's very present on the international market. So, as the professor was saying before, I can say, as you would very politely put it, that through the international activity we can be successful at the Italian level. But the integration of the two uh, um, activities, that's very, very important. Let me give you an example. Um, I was telling you before that I come from the experience with the Footwear Association. So the Mika in Milan is the largest uh, uh, exhibition in the world of footwear. Uh, if I recall correctly, there are 1,500 companies exhibiting, multiplied by three the number of brands, so there are about 5,000 brands uh, inside. Of this, two-thirds are Italian and one-third is throughout the world. And it represents the structure of the world business of footwear, Brazilians, Spaniards, Portuguese, uh, French of course, uh, uh, and the Americans, the Germans, and so forth. Um, this was a very a winning model. It is still the best exhibition in the world. If you want to go buy new shoes, you go there. You go to Milan, you go to the fashion, and you go to the wonderful stores downtown. But it wasn't enough anymore because uh, the average of uh, this was about 70,000 square meters net. And I don't know if, how familiar you are, but this is a big, big exhibition. Uh, you have to double it up because usually for every net square meters, the one gross square meter. So this is about 140,000 square meters altogether. Um, but it had reached a plateau. It wasn't able to grow anymore in exhibitor. It wasn't able anymore to grow in buyers, uh, in media tensions, and so forth. There were an average of 50,000 to 60,000 visitors every six months because obviously it goes together with the season. Uh, the new season, uh, winter, autumn and winter, and springtime and, and, and summer. So the idea is how do we go from there? If we just have this in time, in a, an exhibition is pretty much like a, a, a baby. There's a moment when they are born, there's a lot of excitement around, it's a new thing. And then they start growing and you start getting concerned about what you can do to help them grow. And then they reach a certain moment in which they reach their peak. And after they reach their peak, there's another way they're going down if you don't change something about it. It's pretty much, uh, it takes three years 
uh, and this is not me, but uh, it's the international statistics that prove it, to make an exhibition profitable. So you need to invest money and lose money, basically, or as I invest money, for three years before making a penny out of, any, out of your investment. Then there's an average, depends on the sector, of 10, 15 years when, if the exhibition works, uh, it's uh, going to be very profit profitable. Let's say if out of 10 ex exhibitions, how, do you, how many do you think they survive after five years? Two, 20%. So in order to be able to be successful in this market, you have to constantly come up with new ideas. You have to enlarge your portfolio. And this is only, let's say, in an economy that is more or less steadily growing. Now that we have, unfortunately, a worldwide very difficult, if not a recessive economy, the number is even higher. So you always have to come up with new ideas. You always have to say, even I'm successful now, I need to do something else. And how do you do that? Through networks. You can't do it by yourself. So the people in, uh, in this camp were, are still, the most successful exhibition organizer for footwear. But they, sorry, go ahead. I have a question. I wanted to meet them. Uh, like, is it a task, task to make new things? Or is it the company that is participating who has to create new things in order to be attractive to the others? Like, how can the FIA be more attractive when you're building the infrastructure and the services? And how can you be innovative on that? Thank you for the question. We don't pay you for this, right? <laughs> okay, uh, as I said before, there are events only <laughs> by FIA Milan. And there are events hosted by Fiona Milan. So let's say the Mikan, meat belt, which is purses, bags, uh, and, and uh, accessories, Migo, which is eyewear, Salone del Mobile, which is sporty shirt, are all organized by uh, us industry associations. These industry associations are not alone because at Mika, when I was working for Mika, we had contracts with industry associations of other countries, the ones I named before, Brazil, France, uh, uh, Spain, Portugal, to be able to bring their own companies and to organize the presence of such companies uh, at Mika. So there were several levels of network. The association name is, I'll make it easy for you, is ANCI, Associazione Nazionale Calzaturifici Italiani. But ANCI, as all year round, a network with Abi Calzado, which is the association of Brazil and then Spain, Portugal, and so forth. These associations represent the companies, and they go back to Anche and say, "Look, we want, we would like to see uh, a better definition of the products on the areas where you are present. Uh, we would like to see a positioning of our companies in a different way. We would like to see a show." Uh, done in this in this way. So the organizers of New Ideas is the Italian association. The input they receive is also from the other association that represents their international clients. And then the input goes to Fiat Milano. But it is not a passive way. Uh, basically the association says, look, we need a new fashion show. And so Fiat Milano will come back to them to say, look, we have three or four ideas on how to organize it. Or another element which is good for every every sector of time. We are all nowadays uh, what I call wheel people. We always have a trolley behind us. I was telling professor that in November, even for me that's a bit too much. But in November I was in four continents uh, with two different seasons in four weeks. Uh, from Milan I went to South Africa where it was summer plus 20, lovely Cape Town, joined in Cape Town. And I went back to Milan. I changed my clothes. I went to Russia, below 10. From Russia, I went to Shanghai and Guangzhou. From Guangzhou, I went back to Milan, changed clothes again, I went to Sao Paulo and Brazil. When I came back, my wife says, after four weeks, who are you? I changed the locks, I don't want to see you anymore, but that's the life that we're all doing. So the values are pretty much the same way. They go to Hong Kong one day, and then they go back to their company, they can be anywhere around the world, and then they go to Dusseldorf. Um, 
they want things easy. Uh, yes, they want to do business. Yes, they want to have uh, a very wide offer uh, and so that they go in one place and they find everything. Uh, but then they want things very easy. They're tired, especially in the fashion business, they're very spoiled. They want to be all treated as kings and queens, even if they are a very small store. And they want to have fun. Uh, this is becoming an increasingly factor in organizing exhibitions. Uh, people that are working in, 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 in as international managers, whatever meaning you give this, you know, they go all around the world, but all they see is, as I do, a hotel, an airport, a meeting room, a fair. I could be in Moscow, I could be in Shanghai, the only thing different probably is the dinner at the end of the day. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference. What I want is to arrive at the hotel as soon as possible, get a shower and shave, go back in a very short time to meeting point, do my business, go back to the hotel. Those who don't travel for work believe that you know, it's so fantastic to go around the world. And it is. For me it's better than being behind the desk 10 hours a day. But on the other end, after a while, you want a seamless situation that brings you from the airplane to the meeting room to do your business and go back to the hotel and crash or work on your emails at work because of something else happening. So, to go back to Omega, an example, we worked back then very much on little things like um, welcoming booth at the airport for the buyers that were coming in so that they could leave their trolley right there and the trolley would be sent to the hotel so they could walk around with the trolley. It seems to you a little thing, but think about it. Walking in 70,000 square meters on 12, um, 12 centimeters high heels, like most of the female buyers uh, do. Um, the, we didn't get into the details, but the, the facility of Fiera Milano is one kilometer long uh, uh, central hall. Imagine going back and forth and back and forth so many times. So having lounges and areas where you can sit down and relax a little bit. Something that you take for granted, but Fiera Milan and many others didn't have, and the French don't have yet. Free Wi-Fi for everybody. Uh, we don't live without Wi-Fi anymore, and you want to have it covered wherever you go. So all these small things that, that you know people are thinking, oh, let's have a great uh, exhibition with fantastic uh, uh, products, which is important, but then people are people, and people want you know to relax, they want to be able to do their business and then go away. So the association was telling Fiera Milano, what are the values that their uh, customers uh, put on top? So I still have a very wide <coughs> offer, because obviously in every sector, you think shoes as one sector. Uh -huh. There's women, there's men, there's kids, there's, uh, there's formal, there's classic, uh, there is work, there's streetwear. Uh, so there is a, a, a very wide range of products. So how to divide such products in a very rational way is also another very important element. Because a buyer that's buying high level products obviously wants to go exclusively to these companies. So you have to be able to provide a confined, rather confined area where he or she can go and do whatever business they want to and move away. So the division of the, uh, the products, uh, the way of access, uh, the, the reception area are all elements that are organized, to go back to your questions, proposed by the associations and organized by those who work every day in this, in this business. But the ownership of Mika belongs to the industry association. So this is good for us because it keeps us on our toes and always we have to do our best to provide the best possible scenario and solutions for them because otherwise they might decide to go elsewhere. What is happening today in, in Italy, and let me be proud of my company for a second. As I said before, there are many, many, uh, too many facilities in FIA in Milan. But I would say, sorry, in Italy, but I would say that big players are Milano, Bologna, Rimini, in general. Now what is happening is that, first of all, the concentration process is not just happening at international level. Yes, it is happening at international level, but it's also happening at Italian level. So what happens is that um, facilities that were based on very few sectors, this is uh, general, of course, is yacht, 
uh, um, is all the, the naval technology. Uh, it's not enough to keep uh, one one site alive. So they are close to bankruptcy because the, this one or two or three businesses are going down and therefore they're going down with them. Location is important. Really, I mean, I, I come from a city that's 30 kilometers away. It's great beach, it's great mm, clubs to go to, but it's difficult to reach. It takes time. The hotel level is not that great. So location also no good. And it's going down. Bologna is our strongest competitor. Of course, that's a decent way of connection, a uh, long tradition, several areas and groups. But they are missing something that we have in Milan. Let's say a lesser connection with industry association, which are a living force. As a consequence of this, Milan is attracting a lot of shows from these facilities to Milan. So again, there is a concentration uh, at Italian level. Not enough, but still a process that we haven't seen in 20, 25, 30 years, where every single small town had their own exhibition facility and so forth. Just to give you an idea of how complex the game is. So, if I answer your question, I would like to finish what I was saying about the Mika. So this will give you an idea on how the internationalization process of an exhibition works. So MIGA was the strongest, the strongest, is the most important, the most relevant. There are competitors around the world, of course. There's Paris, there's always Paris. There's New York. Uh, but uh, in Moscow, the association was already organizing fair called Obu Mirkoji, which means in Russian, shoes and the world of leather. But it was owned again by the association Anchi, not run by Milano, run by Bologna. There were shows, several shows in China, in Shanghai, smaller shows in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Hong Kong. And then there was uh, also a number of smaller events, 30, 40, 50 companies uh, uh, in other areas around the world, from Turkey to, to Ukraine for the war, uh, Southeast Asia and so forth. The association and the MICA decided that there were too many things in too many countries without a clear understanding of the brand, the MICA. There was only one MICA in Milan. And the secret behind MICA is this, although it's owned by the Italian Industry Association, it hosts one third of international companies. This is very important for you to understand because it doesn't matter if it's an industry association or it's one of the brands that we own. An event with exclusive Italian company, not even in Italy can work. So you need to attract uh, a wider range of companies to complement the offer of Italian company. And yes, there will be an endless number of meetings where the Italians want to stay in the better positioning and they want to have uh, better conditions because we are Italians, we're in Milan, you're part of developing the Italian system and so forth. But as an international group, we need to grant equal access to companies throughout the world. Because in the end, the success of a, of a trade show is to be able, as I was saying before, to provide the wider or the widest possible offer to the buyers that don't have time. And buyers are international. Everybody wants international buyers. To get the international buyers, you need to have an international offer. Yes, we are the best in manufacturing shoes, we are the best uh, for uh, food uh, and, and design, but we always need international companies. So the strategy, to finish the long story, was to, little by little, transform these uh, minor events with only Italian companies in international events. And so the first step was to China. As I said before, there was first a research done by a marketing research. So, if you think about it, um, an exhibition center is doing a marketing research on China and footwear in China, distribution in China, for an industry association that has to convince their members to come to China together with the same, uh, the same organizers. And so in the end, the Mikam Shanghai was born two years ago. Now we're working, uh, and we are now the widest 
offer of international footwear in China. <coughs> There's no other exhibition that can present as many international companies, not only Italian, but all other countries in China. So this is a very remarkable achievement because there are no Chinese companies in this event, but we are in China and we are selling European international shoes in the most relevant market. Yes, it was a nightmare to get authorizations. Yes, it was a nightmare to convince the local authority that it was supposed to be a benefit to the Shanghai Chinese uh, um, uh, economy. But yes, it was very difficult to convince the company to come to China in such a way. But we did. Now, the next step is going to be New York. So, together with the same group, we're trying to see how we can organize an event in New York, which is based on the same model. But the same model, again, think about structures and groups and multiples and networks, mm -hmm. has to deal with all these three basic players, actually four, the companies, the associations, the Fiera Milano, and the network of Fiera Milano in the company where we're going to. Questions on this? Yes. yes. Did you pass through the anti-association to get to China? Or did you uh, all, all by yourself. No, we signed a contract together with them. We're partners 50 50 on this. There is a contract between Fiera Milano and Asso Calza which is the real name of the association, uh, in which we developed uh, the activities in China. We invest together. Uh, so far, as I said before, this is just beginning of the third year. So we invested, we created a value for the company. We haven't seen much money yet. So hopefully, for the next year, the fourth year, we'll start seeing the revenue start. At the beginning, you were just posting the... the no, co-designing. In this case, we were co-designing. Because we had a company in China, and us, Anch, did not have any experience directly in China. So we worked with our company, which is, going back to what I said before, is the control company together as a joint venture between us and an overmaster. So this is also an interesting thing. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, the main competitor in Europe uh, of... Uh, uh, Mika in Milan is not uh, Premier Vision in Paris. That's a very different, slightly different thing. It's GDS in Dusseldorf. Uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, this was the leading uh, exhibition. But the mistake they made was to focus mostly on German companies. German and Italian. It wasn't truly. Really an international event, while income was always on a wider level, you know, having manufacturers from other countries. So what happened in the year 2000, early 2000, that Mikan became uh, more relevant than GDS. So GDS, because their event was going down much faster than ours, <coughs> together, at the same time with us, decided to open an event in Shanghai. So they, through business intelligence, the company stock. So, uh, some information leaked out on the project of Anchi of landing into Shanghai. The Germans were faster, and they announced three months before us the event that the BDS was organizing in China, together with the Chinese Association. So it was, it was supposed to be GDS Shanghai together with CCPIT, which is the Chamber of Commerce uh, of, of Shanghai. This is a very interesting example of how a network works together. This is of S, its own structure uh, in China, the everyday company, uh, and they seem to have the upper end at a certain point. It was out in the media, they will be organizing this event. The companies were already saying, well, you know, they're Germans, they're arrival. they can organize things very well. So we thought we lost the race towards going to, to Shanghai. But they made a very essential mistake. There's a Chinese word called Wan Shi. Wan Shi hardly translated in every language, but you would say probably connection or working together. It's in between friendship and, and, and doing business together. It also gives you an idea how Chinese think. Personal, business, family gray areas, let me put it that way. Uh, the Germans had uh, a, a, a German general manager, but we had a Chinese general manager. Um, 
The journals came out probably because they felt the pressure of Mika, which was a much bigger organization, moving to Warsaw, so they wanted to be faster than us. But as I said before, you need to have an authorization to organize an international fair in Shanghai. So they went public before having this authorization. Without the authorization, you cannot have the exhibition. So what happened was that the general manager went to the city of Shanghai and to Mr. Xu, I think was his name. This person was responsible, now he's retired, but he was responsible for the overall attraction of the investments in the city of Shanghai in one year over one billion US dollars. So big guy, very important. And the German manager went there. You know, I'm not trying to stir that. Obviously, I'm very happy how things went out, but this is an example. And he went very direct way, very professional way, to the Chinese guy and said, look, we have already this uh, event, it's already prepackaged, uh, we want your authorization, we're going to bring you uh, most relevant companies uh, around the world. In a very blunt, very direct, probably would have worked very well in the States. It doesn't work like this in China. On the other way, our Chinese man, James, uh, obviously it's not James, but uh, for us it's James, uh, he was in college together with Mr. Xu. And uh, they were friends, long-term friends. And so he started going out to dinner and uh, talking to him about the project. And what was his idea about it? How would he suggest to structure this event uh, with the Italians? And, uh, how would he foresee the future development and the involvement of the economy in Shanghai? Long story short, after a few dinners came the projects, after a few projects uh, it came the opportunity to talk to him, obviously following a certain procedure <coughs> that you need to have in China. <coughs> now, it is, it's never, it never, they never had the first event. They closed up shop, they had to go public and say, sorry, we we'll changed our mind, which was a major disaster in communication for them. And Mika was able to have its first event. But again, it was a matter of Guangxi, it was a matter of understanding the local market, it was, a, it was a matter of finding the way of working together with the local authorities, uh, uh, with the local industry association, with the local venue as well. Because the Germans did not even have an agreement with the local venue. They were so fast and were so sure about the impact that this would have in Shanghai to bring the international footwear world there that all of those will be open. There's a lot of background noise in Shanghai. If you go there, I go there probably every other month, and there's always something new. There's always something else happening. Is this so thriving? There are so many things happening that if you think European, if you think America, that we go there and we bring something of value, not, you're never going to make it. You always have to work in connection with local companies and local authorities. So, if I answer your question. So basically, that's how we yeah, I was working with Anche first, now I'm working with Fiera, so our time to say who did what. But anyway, the two organizations work together. But without the local companies and the local people in China, this wouldn't be possible. So this is also very, very important. When you go abroad, always work with the locals and always maintain a very strong uh, national flavor to your control company. Yes, in the end, it's going to be a joint venture you control. Yes, in the end, it's going to be a branch office. You control 100%, but the manager has to be locals. The way of doing business with the local market has to be maintained local, of course, in a framework of a multinational company. Um, but this is also very, very important. So I think that the flexibility that not only Fiera Milano, but let's say uh, some, some groups have, is an advantage. So, if you look, and well, we'll go later into it, into the structure that we have developed now, it might seem not completely rational in the sense that we haven't addressed all the markets in the same way. We didn't say, this is a schedule, this is a module, this is the way we address the market, and so everywhere around the world, the company, the local company, has to be structured that way. Depends, it depends very much on, uh, uh, on the local market. Yes. If Fiat Milano would have been <coughs> Reed, Reed is the number one company throughout the world, uh, it's British, uh, and you know, it's probably 16 to 17 times as rich as we are in terms of financial resources. They go there with 10, 20, 40, 60 million 
dollars and the buy, they're, they're able to structure. We had to deal with two elements. This is very important. We were late compared to the in expanding at international level, and we didn't have as much money as other groups did have. So these two elements had to be turned, there were challenges, they had to be turned into opportunities. So how, and we'll get back to this in detail later, how do we buy, and what do we buy, and where do we buy abroad with the resources we have and with the backlogging time we have compared to our competitors? Sure. Last. Okay, that well, depends on your fellow students. Do you think that the fact that before you worked for the ASSO and then for the Fiera Milan, how do you develop anything? Oh, yeah. For networking. Big time. Uh, before that, I was also working for a company, not in the, in the shoes, but in the furniture. Yeah, um, unlike most Italian, I had the luck and also the opportunity to work for eight different uh, groups. I was working for Conf Industria and industry associations uh, for an industry association and for a territorial association like Asso Lombardo, the association of Milan. I was working for companies uh, in the area of, uh, of furniture and now I'm working with Ferrariano. So basically I can look, and many of my team are like this, uh, I can look at the, the challenge which is how can I help companies to expand their business worldwide, which is this is the only question that should be in the heads of everybody. Uh, from the Chamber of Commerce to the Industry Association, to the companies themselves, of course, to Fiera Milano, how do I help the companies to, to grow in their business worldwide? And, but, but now I can approach it on three different points of view because I know how an association work. So I can provide them the kind of solutions that I know and in the timing that I know this can be approved. I understand very well how a company works and how, especially these days, they need to be fast, fast, fast. And obviously now I'm beginning to understand after nine months how the Fiat Milan is working on the other hand. But yes, they have different lingos, they have different terminology, they have a different approach, and they have different uh, priorities. Uh, I was, the professor was asking me before how I find myself in this new job. I thought it was difficult to work for the Italian Footwear Association as general manager, and it was. But what I was missing there, which I knew before when I was working in the company, is the obsession about the turnover, about uh, your, your customer paying, because one thing is to have a contract, another thing today is to be able to get the money in your bank account. Um, also the turnover, the competition. Uh, but also it's very challenging in a positive way because uh, uh, in these in this few months I was able to uh, interview people from around the world to locate it in the company. Unfortunately, I had to fire people. That's part of my job. Uh, I had the opportunity to restructure the company abroad and I will get into the details later on. So I was able to add another layer uh, to my experience which is uh, as Italians, we always tend to think that Italy has always the branch office of a multinational company in our territory. So the man from Coca-Cola comes and all the Italians are down on their knees uh, hoping that they retain their job. Um, now I'm given the opportunity of working for a small international company, multinational company, which is Italian based. And this is a very interesting thing on how, again, not being stereotypical because this is very easy to go into Italians to this way, Chinese to this way, which is not the case. But there are some elements which are common uh, and some lessons that can be learned, which I'm going to tell you about uh, later, before, later on. Um, before we move on to another subject, let me finish what I was wanting want to explain to you about a city within a city. So let's go back to the facility. Because if you don't understand this, you don't understand why and how we have developed at an international level. So as you see, 340,000 square meters uh, uh, covered and 60,000 uh, uncovered. So it's a very huge facility. Just imagine safety, cleaning, maintenance, uh, uh, logistics. There are a number of companies. We have Sierra Milan, so, and again, it goes into the organization of Sierra Milan. We have our stakeholders. Fondazione Fiera Milano. Fondazione, the foundation, owns the facilities. They own everything that you see 
above and below ground that we have. They own 62% of our shares. What we've done recently, and not actually, not even one, maybe two, our other com European competitors, they never went into the stock exchange market. We are listed in the stock exchange market, so whatever we do, the stock is going to be affected. So 38% of the capital is fluctuating on the stock exchange market. This is very important because we have uh, investors relations, we have uh, uh, all possible, I don't have a financial background, I have a legal background, but I, I have to learn now about obscure things like interim test. Uh, interim test is the test that you have to run on a financial level to see if the, uh, not just the uh, international company, but every single exhibition, which is an asset in our balance sheet, <coughs> performed at the right financial level. So basically, if they are maintaining the promises of growth and value that you have in your books, and this is very complicated, especially for me, I'm not a number guy, I'm a concept guy, but I'm learning this. Uh, all the procedures of, oh, we have Ernst & Young, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, of all the auditors around the world, and of course, we have to reconvert the balance sheet, which is done on the local level at international AIF, uh, international procedures. So all of these elements are really, really important because they all affect the title on the market. So, Fondazione owns 60%. And inside Fondazione, again, we have Region of Lombardy, City of Milan, Chamber of Commerce, all these um, stakeholders. Um, as I said before, but again, this is a very important concept. These stakeholders, yes, want to have a very successful Fiera Milano, but their main interest is in bringing the world to Milan, not so much to bring Milan to the world. But the reality is, going back to just for example, the Mikam that I know, we have others, but Mikam I know very well. So Mikam had 60,000 visitors at its best. After we started uh, going to Shanghai, the main objection was, if you're going to move to Shanghai, not a single Chinese will be coming to Milan anymore. And we're going to be losing a lot of buyers that were coming to Milan. Well, Mikan Shanghai was very small in the beginning. It's still small because, as I said, there are 1,500 exhibitors here in Milan. And uh, when we started uh, in Mikan Shanghai, there were 300. Uh, and again, the funny thing is that two-thirds were Italian and one-third uh, was international. Very much like Mika and Milan. And we haven't done this on purpose. We just said to all the companies and the organizations, who want to come with China, to China with us. And they did. And the percentage was exactly the same, Italian and Italian, as we had before. But the first time, on three days, we had 8,000 individual visitors. So. In the end, this can come more than once during the fair. So one thing in the way you calculate the success of a fair is always square meters, exhibitors, uh, and, and visitors. But there are different ways of counting the visitors. You can count the entries. If I go three times, it's like three Fabio are going there. Or if you, visit, if you consider individual visitors. So we had, not many, but it was okay for the beginning, 8,000 uh, visitors, individual about 21 entries uh, in three days, 21,000 entries in three days, but because we wanted to have a high level, high spectrum of the market. This is also very important. You always have to find uh, reciprocity in the kind of industry you bring and the kind of buyers that you bring. In China it's very easy, in Brazil as well, to have thousands and thousands of people coming to your fair, uh, to filter and to understand who are the people relevant to your fair is a completely different game. So, in Nikam, among the 60,000 visitors of Milan, there were only 1,100 Chinese that were coming. So, what did, what, what did we do in the beginning? We took this, we uh, brought database to the Chinese company that we controlled. Um, we had the uh, database cleaned in the sense that they were able to assess who were the buyers that were more relevant for our event. And then they expanded to the, the, the database to 30,000 
people. Of these 30,000, 8,000 came. This is an amazing turnout. Of 30,000, 8,000 means that the, the way we were able to select the database, understand if the offer was compatible with the people that we were looking for, is an extremely high turnout. Usually it's less than 5, 6%. Just imagine how you can do it. So, anyway, to go back to these people that are concerned about, oh my god, they're not coming tomorrow anymore. The six months later, there were 1,700 Chinese coming to Milan, and after three years, it's 3,000 Chinese. Now, I'm not saying that this is just because of Mikam Shanghai. It is also because the Chinese economy is growing and expanding. But it is also true, because we have seen it through the databases, that people that were not coming before, to, although for 25 years Mikam was the best in the world, that was attracted everybody, there were more Chinese that weren't coming before. Because, again, we're looking at it from an Italian point of view. Oh, it's great, or oh, it's Milan, oh, we have tradition, oh, we have fashion, we have everything. We couldn't reach people in several areas of China. So what we did with Mikam was going around China to present the Mikam. But we didn't go only to Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Shanghai. We went to Manchuria, where it is below 20. Uh, we went to the inner parts of China as well, where you don't want to go. Uh, but in the end, we were able to bring new people, not only to Shanghai, but also to Milan. So to make a long story short, if you are strong abroad, you become stronger at home. If you are strong at home, you can be credible and become strong abroad. One cannot work with the other. The same goes with the media, journalists, more attention. Uh, the same goes with, uh, with the creative people around the world. So if somebody puts you in front of, in order to be stronger in your bank in your country, you need to invest more here, True, but only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is you also have to invest worldwide to get more attention because it doesn't matter how strong you are now. It doesn't matter if for a hundred years in Europe you were number one. You always need to go there to show, not the old show because we can bring 1500 companies, only three are now, there are 450, they're growing. But you're able to showcase what you can see at home. So if you showcase in Shanghai a zipped version of Mika, make sure that other people will be coming, that you will never reach exclusive from Milan. So that's the base of, uh, of it. So anyway, to finish the story, I'm, I'm trying to get to the point. Uh, network, because network is also the meaning of this. This is important. Uh, maybe you missed it, I'm sorry, but maybe you missed it before in the presentation. We have inside the facility 84 restaurants uh, of points uh, where you can buy food. Imagine the number of contracts, relations, uh, um, agreements that we have with other operators. So the network, it can take many forms. It is not just how you as a company structure yourself within the boundaries of what you control, to some extent through merging, acquisitions, investments, uh, organizational restructuring, but there are also there are other areas. I don't know if you're familiar with the theory of control, but it's a very complicated one. But what I understood of is that in life we have three areas. We have the area where we control the situation. Let's say you want to lose weight, it's up to you. Your exercise unless there is a major physical situation. Um, you exercise, you eat less, you forge your body in a way you want. Or you want to go study somewhere and you have enough resources, you do it. It's up to you. It's only nobody else. Obviously, the perception, uh, this is the reality. Uh, it depends very much on the ego. At times, this area where you think you can exercise control is like this, and other times, it's like this, but let's say on an objective point of view, this is more or less the size of it. Then you have the area where you can influence the process. Yes, you cannot say, that's the way it goes. Let's say families should be like this, depending. My, my wife probably disagrees with that, but um, in general, you tend to discuss with others. You can prove your point, you can some, uh, sometimes negotiate, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you play an important role. Unfortunately, 
In Italy, and this comes from the small and medium-sized companies' ideas, it's, uh, it's not very enough. Uh, one other of my experiences was working in the States uh, a long time ago, I was working with a group of lawyers doing joint ventures between European and American companies. And we prepared a lot of documents, a lot of business intelligence, we brought people to the table, but in the end, from the Italian side, always came this question, Who is in charge? Who's the boss? And this is so typical of small and medium companies, not only Italian, but say Europeans, where the control is the most important thing you have. And this, going back to the, the question you had, you know, if my experience is helping you to see things in a different way, yes, uh, this helps me out a lot because the obsession for control is also a limit in the expansion worldwide of many of our companies, of small manufacturing European companies. Because, of course, the entrepreneur is such an important uh, uh, part of the life of the company, doesn't want to leave this in the hands of anybody else. But then he has to be back at the company because he has to oversee the manufacturing process. And he has to be on the territory uh, where he is located for a number of things. Well, if the company is a bit larger, probably somebody in the family can go abroad, uh, but this is also a limitation, not necessarily the daughter or the son of the entrepreneur, just because they studied abroad or because they speak another language are the best they can do. This area very seldom is value, but this is the most important value in international business. Even large corporations cannot achieve by imposing anymore. What is happening in, in, in business these days is that compared to the past, the area of control is getting smaller and the area of negotiation is getting bigger. And this is where networks are established because you can have a network that you control yourself, how you structure your company. But then when you have to work with 80 different partners just to feed the people that are coming to your exhibitions, you can close. Yes, if you are stronger, you can impose certain elements in the contracts and certain procedures. We have some limitations because we are listed in the stock exchange, so in the way we do contracts, we don't have many liberties. But at the same time, you need consensus from others. And therefore, this is very important. And obviously, the last area is where you have no control. And the best thing you can do is to be informed about it and then forget about it. Because you need to know what are the factors that somehow are going to influence these two areas that are not so relevant. In the end, you can do anything about it. You have to understand because it's a phenomenon that's coming, because there are big companies that you can control which are going to buy out things. It's important as business intelligence is not relevant for the way you can do things. And it has an influence on the two. So going back to the uh, informal uh, networks that we have, a formal because we have companies, but just to, to an idea. We can sit 10,000 people uh, to have a meal uh, during our events. Um, we have 12, 20 different formats, both from fast food to very elaborated restaurants. So you also have to better understand what are the needs of your customers. Uh, depending on the events, because an event on wood machinery would attract people which are very different in nature from those that are working into fashion. So you have to open some restaurants and close some others. So you have to decide every time based on the information that you have. So information on your customers, even for, a, for, a, for an industry like ours, is very, very, very essential. And this goes together with a number of other things, you know. Uh, we, work, we have pharmacies, and, you know, we have uh, logistics, so we have uh, uh, all sorts of uh, hardware store inside the uh, here now, because at the last moment when you have an installation and you have decorations, you're missing something when the booth is coming up. And so you have to go and buy something. So this is the area where we are of the influence. When it comes to Pierre Milano, the way we're structured, and then we're going to take a little break, probably. We have, as you said, Fondazione here. 62%. So they decide what they're going to do with Fiera Milano SPA. This is the company. And Fiorano SPA is the company that organizes the events, that uh, promotes all the international activities. But then we have two other companies. <coughs> one is called Nolo Stand, and one is called 
Fiera, Milano, Media. Uh, there are, other than the organization itself and the strategy of, of creating the trade show, there are two other elements which are very important. Number one is the operations. So the booth, basically, or the common area, or uh, the catwalk in the case of the fashion. Uh, so we do organize that for our partners. And then, obviously, the media. Uh, we have several uh, websites, uh, and we work uh, uh, on a digital level. We have uh, technical uh, magazines uh, that are dealing with one sector or another. So this is basically advertisement, contents, uh, um, also organizing uh, uh, events inside the, uh, inside the fashion trade shows, because also this is very important. Uh, I was saying before that a fair is the way that the offer and the demand meet. So you got offer and demand. This was in the beginning. This was the market in Rome. This was the very beginning in 1922 when we had eight companies that started. But now it's getting more complicated because to be successful, you have to have media attention so that they write about you, so that the people know about you, so that you get good reports and basically more people will be willing to visit. Then you have what they call technically multipliers. Multipliers are professional organizations, the architects in New York, the interior decorators of Sao Paulo, the industry associations. So you need to talk to them in order to convince them to tell their members to come to your, to your event. Um, then you have, let's say in a general way, local authorities. Could be hotel associations, taxi drivers, uh, uh, chamber of commerce, restaurants, in, in which you develop again a network of agreements by which you make things easier for your visitors. So it's becoming more and more common. So the stakeholders of the fair, yes, are the exhibitors and the buyers, but more and more are becoming them because also the people are coming for something else now. Yes, they're coming to buy. Course. But when the market is in general declining, obviously there's more offer than demand. So if you're a buyer, say Saks Fifth Avenue in New York, everybody's going to be running after you. Please take my shoes. Please take my 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 underwear. Please do this. So they come here to the business, but they also come here for two other things. New trends, and not just fashion. It could be uh, design in interior decorators, it could be the new technology in, in, in woodworking machineries, and professional contents. This is interesting because we as Europeans like to think we're so evolved, we're so, we have seen it all, we, we are so ahead of everybody else. In Italy, it would be a dream to sell tickets to enter to a professional seminar inside uh, an event, a trade show. You're lucky enough if you're able to attract enough people. In Brazil, we make money out of selling tickets on to how to enter a professional seminar on how to work on yielding process or, or technical process. So also you have to think of different ways on how to make money out of a fair. Because this is also very important, then I'll stop really, I promise after this. But what would you say was the most relevant asset? How do you make money? Out of a fair. How do you make money? Hello? Who is paying us to organize an event? Okay, that company is... Right? The, no, nobody. The exhibitors. What do they pay for? For the space. Okay, square meters. This 
was the obsession after the digital revolution. An exhibition is important because it's large. An exhibition is selling square meters. Let's charge them as much as possible. The exhibition was growing. Remember the little girl, the little boy that was growing up? In the beginning, you don't charge a lot, and then the more successful it is, the more they pay for square meters. But restructuring, uh, companies that are going out of business, uh, um, less time and therefore less days of exhibitions are changing this. And square meters are declining all throughout the world. It's not just a matter of being successful or not. Every or every event, unless you are just creating it, let's say on a mature level, remember between 10 and 20 years, is slowly declining. It's declining because there are less companies in the market, because many are bankrupted, there are less players, let's say. The, you have more offer, more events, so maybe companies are coming with 20 square meters to you and 20 square meters to your competitors, so you don't get 40 anymore. But more important is that the digital revolution is changing everything. So, we have to find new revenues, and revenues go through contents, as I was saying before. So, contents are events, contents are websites, contents are advertisements or infotainment, where they give information, they entertain you, but they also try to sell you something. and through different services. This is also very important because uh, the business model that every organizer had before was you pay me a lot of money here in the square meters, everything else is included. The cleaning of the bathrooms, the cleaning of your booth, the safety of your booth, the television that's controlling your booth, whatever. This is going down, we broke it up into different services and they are going up. It's a basically an exhibition of art. We will give you the very basic space. You want to build the booth? We have the company I showed you before. You want to organize content for your company? We have a company to do so. We cannot look at this anymore because the business model is going, growing older. There are more advanced companies than ours, Basel for instance, Basilea in Switzerland, the managing director of Basel is not able to provide an average cost of the space because the cost of the space and the cost of the contents in Basel is so entwined, they sell you a package where the space is only one of the elements, not necessarily the most important. Uh, services, like, okay, let's go together to China. Now what? I finished the fair, I found five people, maybe they're good clients, I don't know. I am small, I don't know what to do with them. Okay, we'll sell you an agreement with a bank that's able to look into the credit, uh, to its bank statement of this company to see if they're doing business for a while. Uh, you need to establish a contract with find your lawyer. Uh, do you need to find uh, uh, an, um, a logistic company that is too expensive for you alone? We have a contract as a fair, we'll sell you that service. So you have to think not just anymore <coughs> in terms of square meters, which means the fair. So the pressure is mounting. We are getting closer to the fair. And the day before the fair, <coughs> not a single exhibition seems to be ready. Then at night, the fairy comes, and they're always ready. I don't know if you have the opportunity. If you have a friend or somebody that's into this business, try and go the night before the opening. It is madness. Wherever you go, it's Italy, it's New York, it's Shanghai. You think, it's not going to happen. Tomorrow, it's going to be a disaster. Tomorrow, the minister is coming, he's going to cut the ribbon, and something's going to be missing. In the end, in that night, I've been up at 4 o'clock in the morning, at times to follow in China or Brazil, something happens and things come together. But anyway, the attention is stopped here. And then we have the fair, all the attention is going on, and then, you know, it doesn't even decline. That's it. That's the end of business. This was the business model up until, I would say, three, four years ago, and for many companies, it's uh, organized the same. The big money is here. What do we do next? So there are many bodies and many organizations that are working uh, in this field. Of course, private, public, city public. If fair organizers will be able to through a network, because we can do everything by our own, 
uh, through agreements to work because we have the clients. The client trusts us, and this is the value. The value is basically a fair, it's not physical, it's a service. And what is a service? It's a promise. You can't see a fair, I see a fair glass. I like these glasses, I promise, so they, I buy them. Come to my fair, and if you come to my fair in Brazil, I promise you that 5,000 buyers will be there, and that I will be able to help you to give the message to the market about your company. This is a promise. And if you're a promise breaker, that's the end of it. So the promise usually stops here. Now we need to find how to fulfill the needs of the company the day after the fair. That's a little different story. So if there are questions, I'd be glad to answer. The last thing a break is for everybody. No questions? Just wait. <coughs> if I may, I'd like to make a few comments. If you have seen me interesting to see uh, in comparison with yesterday, for instance, uh, which are the generators of complexity. So, before we, we, we have seen uh, a very complicated technical thing, a uh, very complicated number of people doing, uh, operating in different industries with different technologies and all, all the appointments that were like, essential in order to accomplish you know, the product and so on. And the product was there. The, 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 in a very different uh, in a situation like that, uh, the generator of complexity is uh, well built around the, the business idea that you are forming. In a way. So it, it's extremely more dynamic and uh, absolutely complex given the, the number of, uh, of uh, actors that are involved. And this is this is easy because we are talking about an happening and uh, a fair. Another another comment, another lesson learned is uh, about people. Yesterday uh, the guy Mr. Mr. Scott was presenting and uh, he told us that uh, uh, this is an important uh, proverb, English proverb that says it is not what you know but who you know the key point the economy relations why she uh, the, people, the centrality of people I mean networking is uh, something that uh, uh, grows and can uh, survive uh, by trust uh, and trust is something that you can create in a long time and destroying the sudden, you know, breaking the, the promise, as I say. So I think, mean, what I say finally, uh, also if you work, you know, today we are talking about a, a very different industry, a very different situation. We see, first of all, how, how much is required uh, and critical of the quality of management, so the intelligence of, 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 of people, and which is the uh, level of complexity. In other words, I mean, I think that we can say that uh, this complex system does not have never ever a simple solution. Or oh, it, it could be a simple solution. It, unfortunately, it's wrong. And this is very much the one, 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 one thing to bear in mind that we are approaching this kind of just one, one quick remark. Uh, I was thinking while the person was speaking, this is a formula of trust in the business. Trust equals promises, fraught delivery, divided delivery. And usually salespeople tend to over promise and under deliver. I will give you heaven, come with me, we will be great. It works one time. Uh, it better works if not the under promising say promising what 95% what you think you can deliver or maybe 90% because then the 10% which is not perceived as part of the deal it gives all the value to trust if you promise somebody I'm gonna give you 90% he expects exactly 90% if he's 89 is disillusioned but if he gets 95 that 5% makes the whole difference in the trust Okay, we can have uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Um, now that you have a little time to think about it, any other, other than you, do you have any other questions? So far, anything that you want me to elaborate a little bit more? Something that wasn't clear? Something you're curious about? Not at all. Super. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the area of control. So how does an organization like ours uh, expand uh, throughout the world? <coughs> this is as we are today. So you see nice blue flags in the right places. Uh, it looks like we did the homework in a very well-organized manner, thought over, and blah, blah, blah. Obviously, this is true to some extent, and there are also realities which are different from the flag on a map. I was saying before that um, you need to adapt to your company culture in the way you develop your network and you develop your, your, the way you're structured. Uh, you need to think about your business. We were saying before that this is a, a service business, so people are essential. So you don't buy a company uh, that's manufacturing fantastic uh, telephones. Uh, you buy the expertise and the knowledge of people and the relationships of people that make it successful in this business. Then you can have a business model in your head, and you have to have a business model in your head, and you have a direction to go. But at the same time, you have to be flexible enough to adapt not only the structure of your company, but also the products that you have. Uh, let me go back to uh, the experience, most recent experience up until July 1st, shoes again. Um, now things are getting more homogeneous, but up until three, four years ago, uh, the shoes the Italian manufacturers were selling to Russian women were not the same kind of shoes that were selling to women throughout the world. Because Russian women would have a particular taste in terms of accessories, in terms of material, in terms of design, um, in general more aggressive, uh, more luxurious. So companies had to develop a product that was more apt to the needs of the local market. More and more rich Russian women were spending time outside Russia. They were have probably a house in London, they were spending their vacation on the Côte d'Azur, uh, they were coming to Italy, and they saw more and more what other women were looking at. And so, in time, also, they wanted to be pretty much like uh, the other customer they saw. So the taste, the national taste, changed a little bit, and so the product changed, and now it's a bit more homogeneous. If you're big enough to structure yourself so that you can have an adaptation to your product, to your market, you can be successful. Um, when it comes to services, it is even, even more important because, first of all, it's easier. You don't have a physical element you need to change over time. Um, it is faster. It entails less programming and manufacturing process. You don't have to prototype, design, prototype, start the production, correct the production, and then go with the final product. Um, I'm saying this because this is helping you in order to better understand why we ended up the way we are now, both with the structure of the company and with the so-called global products that we have. Um, <clears throat> the first step in our internationalization process uh, was, again, as I said before, with Deutsche Messe, with Hannover Messe. Um, we were looking for a partner that was very similar to us in the sense that they had a strong portfolio of events uh, which was compatible with ours, not overlapping. So we would contribute to a large portfolio and they would contribute to areas where we were not strong. A company that was more or less the size that we are, and a company that had the same uh, challenges that we have in the relationship between the foundation that owns them or the local authorities that put money into it, and therefore they very well can see that this vision, the strategy we have is similar in nature. So yes, we invest in a local level, but at the same time, to strengthen the local level, we need to, we need to be international. So Anna Gomez, Deutsche Messe was the right choice for it. 
Um, the process was obviously very long. Uh, it is always very long, and this is good because, again, when you do not have a product, uh, when you do not have channels of distribution uh, which you use in, in to the consumer goods, the only thing you can evaluate is the company itself. And to really understand the company takes several formal steps, but also informal steps in terms that you need to know the people, you need to know the culture of the company, you need to know the challenges at the national level where you decide to join forces with. You need to have an understanding of, on what direction that market is going. Let me give you an example about India. Uh, we worked together since 2012 with them, 2011 with them in India. Uh, India is the equivalent of what in uh, the States is called, is called the in the boxing, in sport and boxing, the big white hole. There is a certain part of the American culture that would like to see a very good Caucasian boxer. And they always present <coughs> this new guy as a Caucasian boxer that is going to win. And in the end, he never does, because always the African American tend to win. Um, India is pretty much the big white hole of the economy. We're always waiting for India to explode. We're always waiting for the subcontinent to become very, um, um, very prominent in the industry and very interesting for those who export there. It never happens. It never happens because it is a closed market. It never happens because uh, the infrastructures are not very well developed yet. It never happens because of its political, political slash social slash uh, sociological uh, elements are always in turmoil, but a lot of people invest into it. So we were looking for a partner that was going for the long haul, was looking for the long term, and obviously that wasn't looking at revenues right away. And another man said that kind of approach. So um, it's important partner, market or destination, but also the structure and the people and the organization that you have at local level. Um, it is important to have a very good general manager, yes, it is. Uh, he has to be fluent in English, it seems to you as a given, but in some countries, even in India, uh, it is not always very easy. In Brazil, it's a nightmare. I thought that Brazilians being so close to the United States, you could find a lot of good speaking managers, no way. Uh, the sales rep, very difficult. Um, so you need to trust this person because I said before, this is the person, the general manager of the organization that's going to be the face, the, the, the head, the programmer, and the reputation of your company in that particular country. If he fails, your company fails. Um, so we went under a selection process, and especially in a joint venture, you have to have both parties agree on who the general manager is going to be. Uh, and this is also a very, a very tricky situation. Thank God, at the same time, we were working also in China uh, with uh, uh, Deutsche Messe. And there, Deutsche Messe was particularly strong already with all the industrial uh, events. So, how does it work with the Germans? So you get an idea. It is, first of all, On a reality, a 50-50 joint venture. On a technical level, it's a 51-49 for the Germans. Because when we were doing this marriage, they were bringing in many more already existing events than we were. Uh, so, in the end, thanks also to the, I don't know the English for Pati Basa Chai, but for the um, not for the JV agreement itself, but on all the documents and all the governance documents that are underneath it, we can decide on a 50-50% level. But we have to decide on something else, how do we split revenues? Let's say, uh, when we decided to get married, uh, Germany was having 8% of events already running, and we had 20% of events running. So, at the moment, we decided to join forces. 
this was the existing capital. So 75% of the revenues of all events will be going to the Germans and 25 to us. Every new event brought from that moment on, new capital, will be split in 49-51. So the trick is how do we bring uh, new products and how do we enlarge the portfolio to it. <coughs> and so roughly oops, what happens is There are two levels of cooperation. Let's say old events and new events. Uh, in the old events, already existing events, what happens is that Deutsche Messe, AG, uh, can bring companies that they already are their clients in events uh, to Fiat Milano and Fiat Milano does the same thing to events that Fiat Milano is organizing and Fiat Milano does the same to them and so it's basically working as agents on this level then on the new events we need to agree basically this is roughly divided into consumer goods Fiat Milano and industrial uh, events consumer goods and services and industrial events, machinery, tools, technological elements, uh, medicines and so forth on the German side. Uh, we need to agree there is a committee that evaluates the new programs, the new projects. Projects that can, this is interesting also to so understand better how we work, on different drivers. Uh, the Germans work like this, they have a matrix. These are the different countries where they are present. And these are the products that they have, let's say machinery tools. So they have the driving uh, event in Germany, then they started another event in India, and so they tend to complete the extension of the portfolio of everything they have that's filling this. Obviously at different speed, depending on the market, uh, depending on other elements. But that's the way they enlarge their portfolio. Very schematic, very programmed, very controlled. So every now and then they come up with a new idea. We sit down the committee, we evaluate the opportunities, obviously, a procession of numbers, 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 opportunities, and then we decided we both have to agree on a green light of going on a new project, and we start a new project. Then, we think in a different way. Milano is at the center, so as I said before, we have our events, and the events that we host to the association, the events we own. Through <coughs> marketing research, through a suggestion of the industry associations, through uh, requests that we receive from the markets where we are present, we bring our products abroad. This is how we develop for the time being two, actually two and a half global products. We have Food Hospitality World, which I was saying before, which is in Brazil, India, uh, South Africa, and China. And then we have HOMI, which is uh, interior decoration, as I was saying before, which is in Russia and now USA. And then we have Mikam, for instance, that is in China, and so there are others that we're hoping. Um, this can happen in two different ways. It can happen like we have an already existing uh, similar exhibition on site. It's a Brazilian event that was very close to this group, and so we transform the customer base of that event into our international event. We bring companies from Italy, from uh, from Europe, the customers that we have in Milan over there, and in this case, we created a new brand, which is becoming a global brand, as I said before, which is a merging of tutto food and most. Or we simply bring our own product to other countries. Uh, and so we create the, the smaller version of an owned exhibition, Homey belongs to Fiat Milano, 
or we do it through the organizations that I was saying before, the loose associations and so forth. Or there is a third way, now you can contribute to this system, is through the Chinese company. So again, the general manager is very important because he's also the business developer. He's coming to us and says, look, I see a great opportunity for a new event uh, concerning tourism. Uh, so we sit down, we plan this event together, the Germans on one side, the Germans on the other, the Chinese, very important, very important. Again, I will not stress enough how important it is to listen to the local market, to the local people, and never, never have a preconception that you have the right idea. Always test it, always challenge it, always listen, always be able to rethink about it. For as much as we love to the food, and host, and we would have loved to have an international group of food, an international host. In all the four markets that we're present now, rather successfully, we still are working on the process, they said, here is not, the market is not developed enough to have two separate events. We need to have a combined event. And it was very difficult on our pride, on our uh, sense of company, to give up these two shows and make one the new one. But then it was a winning, a winning process. But then, again, don't fall in love with one single um, vision. Because HOMI, instead, was just taken photographed from Milan and taken to the, uh, into other countries. But then again, the most promising elements is the creation of new shows which are coming from the company that you acquire locally. Because they are the eyes and ears of your company. And yes, you have to have a strategy. Yes, you have to have drivers. You have to have KPI. But in the end, you also have to get from the market where you're present the information that are feeding into the process. So it is difficult enough when it's you and the, and the branch office. It is more complicated if it's you and the joint venture when 50 or 49% is owned by you, 51 by another company. What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of this? With a joint venture on the market, say India and China, you have long term, which in this business is always, in every business, but in this business, but it was always good because you don't make money in the first few years. So if you don't think long term, you're dead. And you need to think quantity as well, because again, I, tell, I told you before, let's say it takes three years to be pro pro profitable, and it takes 10 shows to produce two. So you always, every year, you need to come up with new ideas, new shows, new seminars, new uh, um, uh, opportunities to build up your process. Uh, this is very important. So long term is the first thing. Number two is international perspective. Uh, this, you know, probably in this class you heard it time and time again. What does it mean? Uh, you can break it down in technicalities, you can break it down on a legal point of view, you can break it down on a financial level. The reality is, understand another point of view, understand another perspective. You do not have all the answers. Nobody has the answers, all the answers. You have some, you have a part of it, and another has another part of it. That's the basis of the network, that's the basis of when you work with a network of other associations, companies, branch offices, uh, top-down, not anymore, it's too complex, it's too changing too fast. The, the real answers sometimes are at the bottom of the structure, not at the top. So you need to think pretty much more, I don't know if you're familiar with the way uh, Western people think time and Asian people think time. This is very interesting. Uh, Usually, Western civilization is based on a line. This is time. So, we go <coughs> from point A to point B to point C to point D. Let me give you an example. Uh, I want to go and sell my products to China. So, what do I do? Well, first of all, I do, if I'm a big company, a marketing research, I try to do my homework at home. You call it business intelligence, you call it whatever you want, strategy, building. So first you think, basically. Then what do you do next? Well, you go to the country. It could be through an exhibition, it could be through uh, contacts. Anyway, you go to the country. 
and you start learning first place. Let's say in my business, uh, we help companies to come to an exhibition. What happens in the exhibition? They meet people. Again, people, people, people. They don't meet com companies. Don't meet people. Meet companies. Don't think people think. Companies are a way that we structure the way we work, and obviously, if you, if you are listed on the market, the way you are reliable towards exchange, uh, stock exchange. But it's the people factor which is fundamental. So let's say you meet people, and then you decide to do local business together. So you start with the due diligence, you start uh, getting to know each other, you start thinking about uh, what kind of distribution system you're going to be putting in place. You structure your relationship with your local partner, unless you are so big that you have so much money and you borrow the table, but it doesn't happen anymore. And then you start, you know, you have a contract, you have a structure, and you start working. That's the way we think. Now let me show you how mostly Chinese, but most Asians think. In terms of time and business model. More or less. Same, same story. First, you want to understand the strategy. You want to see um, where to go. Then, you go to the place. Let's say I make it easy. Think. Place, move, find, people, get structure. At that point, the Asian companies have something here, which is evaluation. And it can be all the things. Uh, it can be uh, things are not <coughs> really fast enough. Uh, with this partner that we have. Uh, it's not the right partner, or it's a good partner, but I want to do something different with that. And so, they start thinking again. Uh, probably they consider other places to go, or even the same place. They're considering other people, or yourself, and they restructure the uh, way to do business, either with you, or with another company. And this goes on and on and on. So this can be very frustrating at times for Western people that are thinking on a, on a timeline which is basically A and B and C and that's it. I'm not going to discuss it. No. Discussion, and again, discussion means people. Means listening and talking. Listening and talking. So that's very, very important uh, in, uh, in the way we do business. So this is one way we work on, which is India and China. Then we have another way, which is Turkey. Turkey, three years ago, was one of the most promising, closest markets outside Europe. Uh, and a lot of developing, uh, a middle class that was growing very fast. Very strong in manufacturing, not as strong still in the consumer goods area, but there were good promises that this would happen. Perfect market for us. So we went out shopping and we found a company named Intertext. in Istanbul. Um, they were working in an interesting field where, similar to us, arts, we organize fairs uh, of contemporary art around the world, in South Africa, in Istanbul, in Milan, um, but also in areas which were complementary with us, uh, like uh, uh, cosmetics, because in Italy, unfortunately, this is an area where Bologna is working very well. Uh, so, you can compete with a local competitor, Bologna, by developing a product elsewhere in the world that's becoming so important that somehow can attract some of the exhibitors that are in Italy to go to Turkey. So competition now is becoming also not always physically related to one area. It's more, it's a promise, remember, who can keep the promise? So it's very difficult for Kerna to start an exhibition in Milano, where in Bologna you have Cosmoprof that's been successful for so many years. Maybe it's easier if we start working in some of the countries where we are able to work. Home and garden, gardening uh, was also important. But another relevant thing is that so far, Kerna Milano, all the events I was describing are B2B. 
basically means that there are companies selling to other companies. I manufacture, you buy, and you put on the market. This interface was working B2B, but also B2C, which in many countries is a growing business. Uh, we have here in Milano, uh, I'm sorry for those who don't know it, but uh, Artigiano in Fia, and uh, it's basically a huge event where you can buy things at the moment, you can eat things at the moment, uh, but definitely a B2C event. Apart from, which is organized by another organization, uh, we just host it, uh, we don't own it. It's Compagnia delle Opere. But uh, we learned that that would be a very successful way, we just didn't have the skills and the capability of understanding the dynamics of doing this. So you learn. You buy knowledge. You don't buy just the market. Uh, or you buy a presence, offices, and you, 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 it's a betting city. You acquire, let's say. You acquire knowledge, you acquire relationships, you acquire a different angle. So in Milan, we didn't know how to organize BTC. In, in Turkey, they didn't know that. So by doing some events with that, the Roman Garden, and the Beauty and Care, and so forth, we are learning something. Here we are bringing back to the headquarters, and then it's a different sensitivity that we can also bring to other countries. So, the portfolio, remember, it's important to have many events because many events die and only two out of ten, blah, blah, blah. The portfolio, you can do it by expanding the B2B, but there's only a certain limit you can reach. So here, you find different markets, even the same sectors, but then you can double up the events if you go to B2C. And it's also, it's called, technically speaking, a cash cow, which means you make money out of tickets right away. You don't have to wait three years. If you organize an art fair where people have to buy tickets, where there is a, an artistic uh, uh, installation of Marina Abramovic being there, people pay money for it, this is revenues. Uh, JP Morgan pays good money because they want to have a sponsorship. Sponsorships is something also that I didn't mention before, it's a growing income in fairs and exhibitions. Uh, still, in Milan, we're not that used to it. Other countries around the world, Brazil or South Africa, they are very relevant. They make a big part of the money that you make in income. So I, I when I was saying in November, I was traveling throughout the world, we had our, our fair of art, contemporary arts uh, in, in um, Cape Town, and people from New York or JP Morgan were there. They liked it so much, so that the next time they're going to be sponsoring our VIP program. And so this is not square meters, but it's a way to bring more buyers, more collectors, and if you bring more collectors, you bring more galleries, if you bring more galleries, you have more sponsors. That's the way it works. So don't think exclusively, my client is the exhibitor. My client is everybody who can bring value to my, to my fair. And you have to think in a wider way. Uh, that's also very challenging, but also very stimulating in my business. So the business model is changing so fast, where we tend to say, you know, there's no money in the market. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the blue, 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 blue ocean, red ocean uh, theory, but they say that you know, there are two markets basically. One where everybody is, everybody's doing the same thing, they're competing, prices go down, companies go out of business, and only a few prevails, or really larger. Then you need to find a new market. So, how do I find a new market if I'm doing basically the same thing that other people are doing? I need to find other revenues, and I find other revenues by finding other services and catering other clients. So for me, it's more important that JP Morgan people are, and they enjoy themselves at the pool, and we bring the limousine to their place, because next year we're going to bring two million US dollars to this event in sponsorships. And to make two million dollars of revenues in square meters, I have to bust my rear end for a very long time with regular customers and exhibitors because, as I said, square meters are going down and down and down. So, uh, this is easier because arts fall a very different path than machineries. But, at the same time, you need to think why. And you have to think other markets, how I bring culture of other markets and other way of doing business into my own without losing my direction. You always have to have vision, you always have to have directions, but you need to add things on the way you go. So it's yes, you teach some, you learn some. Uh, based on our experience, you teach a lot into organization. Yes, we still can teach a lot. Uh, we, you teach a lot in ethical, 
we had to have some situation in which we have to clear the way business is done because uh, there are no bribes, there are no, nothing that we can do of this, of this sort. Uh, obviously for an ethical decision, but also for next uh, um, exchange, stock exchange market procedures. So we're very strict about this, but then we have to lose some business of the companies that we acquired because some of the business was done in some countries putting something on the table. That business we lost, we had to gain some more business done in a very international way. So you always have to, to enlarge. The similar example, ah, of course, I forgot to mention, there are two key people here, husband and wife. This is uh, also an element that we, we, we find uh, almost everywhere. There are two kind of companies in this business. Uh, those who are prevailing, of course, are the large multinational corporations, those without a venue, a facility, and, and those with a big facility, but they are big. And then you have the small family-oriented uh, Caterer, uh, customer based uh, smaller companies, and they always have a couple in South Africa, in, uh, in Turkey, was a husband and a wife. And again, very important if they are the center of it all, if people are so important, if they have been in this market forever, how do I put together the need of a multinational company to be stronger than the individuals? because we need to survive no matter what. Uh, that's the difference. A family company, at the best, thinks about the next generation of the husband and wife or the daughter or the mother and so forth. A multinational company is here to stay and has to think on a level where if anyone decides for any reason to leave, the company goes on. So you do this through contracts. You decide to hold on to some of the stock exchange, to some of the uh, value. In this case, we bought 60% of the shares, and 40 was still of the husband and wife, Hussein and Yejin, because again, yeah, they're people. Uh, and the name we kept Intertex Fiat Milan. In three years' time, Intertex will disappear, Fiat Milan Turkey will take over. They will pass over contacts to other people and they'll move out a good amount of money if they perform in the way we're expecting them to be. So you keep them loyal by retaining a big chunk of the value of the company in there. You inject new capital. You go up in the scope in the business with B2C uh, together with B2B. And you have three years' time, and they know that, in which they will have to pass along. Of course, you have also non competitive agreements because you don't want. The worst thing you want to happen is that they leave the company, they form company B, and because it's them, all the value goes to the other company. So you have to have very binding non-competitive agreements as well. And at times, uh, lawyers are useful in this case. Um, this is an example in Turkey, but there were similarities in, the, in South Africa. Uh, South Africa is not a large market, but it's a very essential market because it is the gate to Africa. So if you want to do business also in other countries, it's a good base. So in South Africa, we had a company with mother and daughter. Uh, they were fantastic. I say where because now they're not part of the company anymore. Because the three years had gone by and uh, we had planning through. And they both moved to Australia. Uh, we don't care if they open a new company, we are not there. Maybe they open and we'll buy it later on. But uh, um, in this case, we have to work very hard on the organization of the company. Because with the Turks, uh, again, not a stereotype, but a year is very important in Turkey. And structures and titles and organic rounds are very important in the company. South Africa, eh, not so much. Uh, so what happened was that mother, Christine, was the PR and the visionary of the company. She was the one that was able to understand where to go, knock the doors in a very, very complicated international environment. Uh, we all read about South Africa, we all read about apartheid, we all read about Mandela. Believe me, I've been there seven times in the past nine months, and the more I learn, the less I understand the complexity of the relationship between the different ethnical groups. The impact on business that these have, let me give you an example. We have this very successful uh, uh, art event in Cape Town. 
Cape Town is becoming the new trendy places to be for design, for culture. It is also the most relevant gay hub in South in Africa, and it's bringing a lot of creativity there. A lot of things are happening. Um, at the same time, Johannesburg is the center of the economy, uh, more manufacturing oriented, where the white elite, because still exists in South Africa with a lot of money, is in Cape Town, and the new middle, black new middle class is in, in Johannesburg. So, we have a competitor for the arts in Joburg that started three years before us. And we have Cape Town here. Joburg was very strong because they were catering to the affluent new black middle class that now wants to buy contemporary art. Um, but because of social, racial, and political reasons, there are also two different administrations, two political parties between Cape Town and Johannesburg, the, um, this group of collectors would never go to Cape Town. But there was a growing demand of the international, of the white uh, Caucasian, sorry, the Caucasian uh, elite uh, in, in, uh, in Cape Town that would never go to Johannesburg for obvious reasons. So we created a new show. We realized that here was missing two things. One, international collectors and galleries. And here, Caucasian elite. Then, uh, we were informed that in Cape Town there was a plan of developing the largest contemporary art museum in all Africa. The managing director of Puma, the, the athletic year, uh, his name is Dr. Seitz, uh, has decided to open a foundation in his name and his wife, and they are building this vast museum that means also they are buying a lot of contemporary arts there. And the museum is in the same area where we have our show. So we started having a relationship, again, network. So now we can talk to the municipality of Cape Town. We can have better deals on our venues. We can have better uh, uh, rotation in the bus systems, uh, uh, better prices in the local advertisement. And again, a network and group, which in this case is not structured in a very in a very firm way, but as a common interest, how to bring more attention to the city of Cape Town. Then a small event on design development, design and arts go very well together. Wow, thank God, we're organizing this in the mobile in Milan, so maybe we can do something about it. So we have now the uh, week of design in uh, South Africa. So week and art, uh, design and art go together. And again, this is because of the experience we have in Milan. <coughs> in art, in Milano, and Salon del Mobile. So we bring people that think that way, they're able to put things together. And again, connecting knowledge and people. Long story short, this is going down, this is going up. And now, the gentleman who wants this show wants to come to terms with us and sell us this show. And if we do it, if we buy it, it's the greatest thing because the black market will never move here, and the white market will never move here. And that's the, that's the way it is. I'm sorry, I'm not judging you on an ethical point of view. I don't even start to understand the complexity of it. I know if I want to develop, on a business level, a successful number of activities in arts, I have to have two shows. Which, it doesn't make any sense on, on a business level if you didn't have these interactions. But you have them, you need to know, you need to understand, and you need to have people that understand these dynamics. So don't think that your model is the winning one because it's winning well in Milan. You always have to think how it can be implemented at the local level, but how to use your strength. Design and art good in Milan are helping now design and art uh, together in, uh, in Cape Town, South Africa. So these are examples. So going back to Christine, Christine is now 67 and is happily retired, but uh, Christine was the missionary in the PR. Uh, Louise was her daughter. And she was really a powerhouse in sales. She's one of the most tremendous sales reps I've ever met in my life. Energetic, strong, go-getter, positive. But the problem was that the relationship, both personal and professional, the mother and daughter, was so strong that they were only good together 
but only if they were there. So the company around them was structured not in a very clear way. So what we had to do, we had first of all to sign a contract with them to say, we look three years down the road, you're going to leave the company. Uh, in, she had 15%, she had 10%. So we, buy, we bought her out uh, this August. And uh, with Christine, we closed the uh, last uh, three weeks ago. But now, what we did there is to restructure the company. So now we have a new general manager that has nothing to do. She doesn't have the shares. We, have, we own it on 100%, so we have full control in this branch office. Uh, the general manager uh, has experience in the field, so the face, the relationship, the other relationship that we have. And we have structured the company in a much better way. It's not a big operation, it's only 30 people. It's not it's a large, large company. But now we have an operation manager, uh, CFO, and administration. We have sales, and we have marketing. This before didn't happen because Christine was entering the morning and she knew Josephine every morning and she would talk to her on a more personal level rather than on a company level because they were always together, because they built this company together, because the relationship and the knowledge of each other was more important than the structure because this company was structured in a way that Christine and Luis never thought they would lead. But we, as a corporation, need to change the game so that if the general manager leaves tomorrow to another place, the company is still in place. So again, another structure where we brought something, how to structure a company or a branch office, and they brought something, the knowledge of the market, the, the knowledge of the people. So again, there is not one single way to develop your, 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 your way. Uh, two more examples and then I'm done. Uh, Singapore. Which is a small operation, but interesting because Singapore is also a hub for Southeast Asia. In Singapore, we don't have a company. We just have a JV agreement, a commercial agreement, with Sinjex. Sinjex is the uh, city or state uh, organization for organizing fairs and exhibitions. And so we planned and decided uh, uh, to organize events. We have one on uh, re rehabilitation and medicine together. We're building another one in the field of cleaning, uh, where we only work on the terms of a project. We don't have a company together. We only have, we split revenues and costs uh, of the single event. And last but not least, the United States of America, which is the most complicated of them all because we didn't have any background there. Uh, we are using what is called embedding. Embedding is a technique which is used by journalists when they go on the war field. You put one journalist inside a, a group of uh, Marines and he's dressed up like them and he's part of the, the action. So we go inside other events. So when homie is now going HRMI, remember was inter internal decorators. Uh, he's going inside the ICFF, which is the Salon del Mobile of New York. So we are not investing uh, in a company, we are not investing with a partner, we're just working together inside a much larger organization. This is the first step. And we're going to do this also in the field of food for the future, uh, and probably in fashion as well. Once we have enough events running, because we could not afford to buy a very interesting competitive company in the States because it would be too expensive for us. So once we go on the back of the others and build enough events, we will establish our own branch office. So once again, in the end, the idea, and this is my final statement, is to have Milano at the center and in time, all branch offices 100% via Milano. But to reach that point, we need to address it, taking into consideration our resources, the market, the time, the companies, and the people that we are able to get in contact with. So, what you buy and the structure you give and the network you decide to have has to have a clear direction, a clear vision, and a clear timing uh, in when you want to achieve a, a result. But the raw material, the, the people and the, and the companies that you start with, that's not necessary to fit right now the structure you have, you have visualized. 
you can bring them to that point. The point in between is you have to make it profitable to reach that point. You can invest a certain point, but then if you don't make money out of it, you can have all the best ideas you want, you can have all the contracts worked out, you can have all the perfect joint venture structures, but if you're dead in the market, you're dead in the market, that's not the way to go. So always carry in mind, it's great to have a structure, it's great to have a vision, it's great to have a, a network that you want to put in place. It's extremely important to select the partners and the people, but then you have to accept the fact that to get from point A to point B, maybe there's A1 here, maybe there's A2 here, maybe there's A3 here, and finally you get to B. Don't get trapped by your ideas. It's the direction that matters. It's like a river. Uh, and again, go back to the control issues I was telling you before. Most of us think of our life that we like to have control over it, so we're going in this direction. And basically, we follow this line. Uh, companies are more or less, when they're successful, when they're not, they're not. They're like a river flow. At times they change, they go up and back, they slow down. In the end, they go towards the ocean. But you cannot expect to be a precisely line, precise line that goes exactly the way you want, and that you cannot control every factor, because you can only control the factor inside your company, but even the factor inside your company have to deal with the markets. You don't control the markets, the markets control you. Uh, the example that we make with our industry association is, well, the fair was successful or the fair was not successful. This is not like, well, like you're indicating that thing over there, you're looking over there, which is the market. Don't look at my finger, which is the fair. People tend to confuse the two things. A fair is successful, so is that me for the market. No. If the market is healthy and I organize a good fair, I can help you out. If the market is not healthy, I can do the best fair in the world, but it ain't going to work because simply there's not enough money, there's not enough buyers, the market is not working. Okay? Okay. I don't know if there's time for export two words or is it late? Five, 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 five minutes. Just very briefly, if you're staying in Milan, since May 1st, if something, we will see a very interesting event, not just this one. Anyway, the Expo is about to start. Uh, as you know, we are not directly organizers of Expo like many things. We have few events that are organized, we have few pavilions that we are organizing. Uh, but we are organizing very important things like the business matching program, together with Pricewaterhouse Cooper. We have a program of putting together the companies that Expo is not about, technically wouldn't be about business. But of course, we're trying to also create opportunity for business. So we have a um, digital business matching program that we have developed together with uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Milan and Price of the House Cooper to put together the companies that are visiting uh, Expo, both Italian and uh, international, to get together with facilitators of the meetings, with work that's going to be done before the meeting itself, so that once they finally meet, uh, they have uh, enough elements so that the meeting will be successful. And again, this goes in the era of the services I was telling you before are going to be interesting for the future after uh, the fair. If we're going to be successful, and we, we will be um, testing this system, we will be using this system throughout the world, the Milano. So we will try to put in touch before the fair, buyers and, and, and sellers, so that once they come to the fair, they already know uh, who they're going to see, they already know where to go from there, and therefore to add to those added value events which are important. Forget about it. Um, and also, Fiera Milano is organizing the Italian Pavilion, is organizing a number of events, like Tutto Food, which is going to be five days after the opening of uh, uh, Expo, which is the largest event in Italy and in South Europe about food so as well. There's a lot of exchange between the two events. So we are not co-organized, but we're trying to bring our business-oriented capabilities into the Expo, which is, in its nature, an event to to talk about contents, to, to provide information about different countries, to exchange information and professional and also to the public, but it's not thought over for business. Fair enough is feeling that gap. We're trying to make it a business event as well because we think it's a fantastic opportunity. When I go throughout the world, I was telling the professor before, 
In Italy, we are so pessimistic about exploiting. We're going to have so many problems, we're not going to be ready, uh, the mafia is involved, uh, it's not going to be worth it. Outside, there is a tremendous interest from China, from Brazil. Uh, they're so excited to be here, and for me, it's always very enthusiastic to be able to see a different perspective again that people have on our country in an event that should be so important in our country. And that, again, teaches me that, yes, I can contribute with my Italian point of view, but the nicest and most wonderful thing in my job that I get different points of view that challenge my vision every day. And if you are able enough to keep your vision, because you have to keep it, but at the same time to incorporate into this vision the ideas of others, people, nations, and companies, that's how you build a successful network. Okay, <coughs> thank you very much. I think that we had a, a really, really interesting presentation. I think that... <laughs> I think I repeat my comments on what I mean. It is extremely interesting, it has been interesting itself. <coughs> For the presentation, and it is also exciting to see for us to think about the connection between so different environments that we agree. A complex game. Thank you.